Thanks, Nicola. So I'd like to really uh, thank the organizer. It's very nice to be in this session. Uh, I mean, with all the speakers, I don't really have to introduce high throughput computing. The bad news is I hope you're not fed up <laughs> at this time with, with anything that's high throughput. Um, so interestingly, you, you're going to see some common themes uh, in, in this talk, I mean, with, with what the previous speaker talked about. Um, so the, oops, I have to plug it in, of course. So as I said, I'll, I'll go very quickly on the principle of high throughput computing. Um, then I will, I will show some examples and try to, to see if we can learn some, some general things about high throughput computing in these examples. And these examples are transparent conducting oxides and, and something a little more recent and that's more, a little more exotic, which is electrides. Um, and I will make some points, uh, if I have some time, on, on the challenges of, of scaling up in, in automation, especially in terms of software and methods and workflows. So I don't have to show that for a long time. You guys know all about high throughput computing now. Uh, and, and the specific example where we apply this type of technique is transparent conducting oxides. And I, I, I mean, you can ask, ask yourself, I mean, why do you need a transparent and conducting material? You actually do have a transparent and conducting material in your pocket if you have a smartphone. Uh, there's a touch screen, the touch screen is a transparent conducting material. And it's an interesting problem for the material scientists because usually the transparent materials are not very conductive and vice versa. Um, so there are ways to make transparent conducting material. This is known for decades now. You basically take an oxide with a large enough band gap that will give you transparency, and then how do you get conductivity? You just dope it. Uh, you can dope it N-type, you can dope it P-type. Uh, this is the, these are the options. Um, it is, these materials are known, they produce, they mass produce actually on the N-type TCOs. I mean, this is a big industry. Uh, indium oxide, for instance, is a very big uh, transparent conducting oxide. The problem is more uh, in terms of scientific challenges is more than P-type TCOs where actually there's not widely commercialized P-type TCO. And the reason why is, is properties are just poor. Uh, one of the properties, which is the mobilities of the carriers, is roughly one order of magnitude difference between the best P-type in the lab and the best N-type that are known. Um, this is a gap that's a problem for certain applications. Uh, the most fancy ones being having transparent electronics. Uh, maybe more relevant uh, for the planet is, is that solar cells uh, would, would, I mean, you can have new device, a new type of solar cells if you had a P-type con conducting layer and transparent. Um, so if you get back to the basics, what's, what's driving conductivity is the amount of carriers and also the mobilities of your carriers. And if you get back to mobilities, what's driving mobility is scattering, which is typically not uh, very easy to get from ab initio. And then you have a big component of effective mass. What, what, I, what I mean here is that a material with a lousy effective mass is not going to be a high mobility material. This is, this is a necessary condition. Uh, and the good news is that effective mass is something you can get I mean, relatively easily with, with simple DFT band structure, and, and the effective mass, at least for screening, are not that bad with DFT. So this is what you want. Uh, you know what you want. you want. You want a material with specific band structure. You want a low hole effective mass. I mean, something like lower than one would be great. Uh, you want a band gap that's higher than 3 EV to get you transparency. And something important also, you'll be able, you want to be able to make this material P, OK? Uh, I don't really care about what's happening at the conduction band. I really focus here on P-type oxides because this is where we can really need new materials. Uh, this is the, the blue black I mean, You've seen a lot of, of these funnels. I mean, this is an horizontal funnel. Uh, and the mobility we assess by whole effective mass. Then we go to transparency through band gaps. And then carrier uh, through dopability. And we've done that screening on known oxides. And, and this is an important point. I mean, we're not making predictions here. These are materials that are known, that are supposed to exist, that have been reported to be synthesized. But most of the time, you just don't know their property. You don't know if they're transparent. You don't know if the carriers will be uh, highly mobile or not. In terms of technique and codes, um, this is done at the DFT level. Then we go GW and also GW or HSC, actually. And, and so far, I haven't seen much discrepancy in terms of the defects computation with both these methods. Um, so let's, let's start with the first step. I'll get back to, to infrastructure, uh, but band structures are not the most difficult thing to, to, to automatize in terms of workflows. And we, we, we I mean, build this workflow that basically gives you a band structure, a DFT band structure for any material. Uh, if you have the band structure, then you can extract an effective mass. 
This is easy to say. By the way, you can have different definition of effective mass. I'm not going to go into details. I mean, if you're interested, come talk to me or, or look at our papers. Uh, I think you have challenges, in, for instance, if you have several bands. What, what, which one, which bands do you take? Uh, you have to be careful with that. Um, then you, you, you take that, I mean, you take to 6,000 material and you have all this database of effective mass and you can start screening. You can say, give me the very low hole effective mass. That's what I want. That's what I want to start with. And if you look at the 6,000 material and you give a reasonable criteria on effective mass, from 6,000, you end up with 20 around. And this is the point I wanted to make into my title. This is really needle in the ASTAC problem. And by the way, you can see that from the other speaker's talk. Usually, you have this type of problem where you start with a lot of possibilities and you end up with, with a handful, maybe, interesting material. And this is really only one property. This is my first property. You can be optimistic, and the good news is that if you have only 20 compounds, you can actually do much better than, than DFT, and you can, for instance, do GW on these 20 compounds. This is totally doable uh, in terms of compute, computational time. Um, so if you combine all of that, the first screening on DFT effective masses, and then you, you get band gaps more accurate with, with GW, you get this plot. This is band gaps and effective mass for all, all the red dots are basically those materials that are known in the inorganic crystal structure database. And we've compared them with the known P-type TCO. This is the, the, the best P-type TCO in the lab. And you can see that by design, of course, all of them are, are getting better in effective mass. You see that some of them will absorb too much. Uh, some of them are really interesting. And by the way, I've put the effective mass here of the N-type, and you see there's hope for some of the materials to get as highly mobile as N-type. But there are not many materials. Um, I haven't talked about something which is dopability, and this is really the very, very last screening we do, and this is important actually in many applications, I think. Um, I think we've been spoiled with, with silicon. We sometimes have the feeling you can dope everything N-type or P-type. Uh, this is definitely not the case in oxides. So it's not because I'm coming with a nice oxide and I say, oh, if you could dope it, that would be great. There are sometimes intrinsic defects in oxide, and this is very well known, that will prevent any doping. And what I'm really looking at here is, because I want to do whole doping, is whole kitters. And oxygen vacancy is notoriously known to be a whole kitter. Um, I'm not going to go here in details, but you can do defect computation. I mean, this is, there is a huge uh, community doing defect computation. Um, and you can actually have a sense of, do you, do, is your material have, does your material have a lot of whole kitters? If you have a lot of whole kitters, that's a no-go for making a P-type TCO. And if you do that, there are a few materials that are actually killed purely by, by defects. And I, I think this is important, an important point. I mean, defects are important, and we're going to have to take care of them more and more in high-throughput computing. But let's pick at the materials that are in the sweet spot where they seem to have an interesting large band gap and low hole effective mass. And I'm not going to talk about all these materials. I'm just going to pick one. And I'm going to pick that one because that one we worked with experimentalists actually to, to kind of see if we were right in terms of, of the interest of this material. And this is barium bismuth tantalum oxide. This is a very interesting band structure, large band gap, and a very curvy uh, valence band. And this is what you were looking for, curvy bands and large band gaps. Uh, by the way, we did also a defect computation that shows that this material has a tendency to be P-type, but the defect chemistry was quite complex. It's a mixed perovskite, so it's a double perovskite, bismuth 3 plus and tantalum 5 plus go on the uh, B site. And there's something that's wonderful about perovskite, you cannot really compute that, but for some reason, if you go to an experimentalist and you ask them to make a compound, they're usually not very happy. They're like, oh, why, why this? And then you say it's a perovskite, and then they're okay with it. I don't know, they're fascinated by perovskites. So we managed to convince a few uh, bold experimentalists to actually make this material. By the way, this was a known material, so, but still, there were still challenges in making, making it really pure uh, and getting thin films of it. So this is a collaboration with Professor Kim and, 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 and also Professor Sintevich for, from Cornell. So they made this material, and then you start characterizing it, and then you're a little bit, as a theorist, a little bit anxious about the result you will get. Uh, good first news is that this material is definitely transparent, very transparent. Uh, then conductivity measurements were not that good news because, as is, the conductivity was not very high. You could not really measure any conductivity. So we looked into, okay, can you, I mean, can you extrinsically dope this material? And potassium is an obvious, obvious choice for crystal chemistry, but also from, from computation. And if you dope the potassium on the barium side, then you can get conductivity. And the best sample we had in terms of mobility with whole measurements are around 
uh, 38. And, and I remind you that, that the best p-type TCO are around 10. So this is a big step. This is a big step to find this material. There are not many oxides with such a high uh, hole mobility and still transparent. Um, so this was very nice. And why is it this material not in your next uh, smartphone? I mean, the problem is actually carrier concentration for the moment. So mobility is great, but the defect chemistry of this material is so difficult to deal with that we cannot reach higher carrier concentration than, than 10 to the 14, which is really low. It's at the limit of the measurement you can make, not very useful for a device. So we're working now on getting that, understanding better the material and getting that higher. Um, an interesting thing is that you can learn something here. I think mean, this is the first bismuth-based uh, P-type TCO. And bismuth is really an important ingredient in the story. If you actually look at the character of the valence band, you would see that this bismuth hybridizing with oxygen P. And this is an important ingredient, because if you had only oxygen P, you would have a very flat band. And because you have bismuth, you start hybridizing and you start making your band more curvy. Um, so maybe there are other also bismuth-based uh, materials that could be very interesting. By the way, the field of P-type TCO would not have suggested something with bismuth. This is not very common. Um, on this line, you can say, okay, is there anything more general than just you, you want to work with bismuth? Actually, you would like to work with uh, main group reduced elements. Bismuth 3 plus, but also SN2 plus, PB2 plus. They really show up a lot in our screening, and it makes sense. What happens with those guys is that they really, their orbitals, their S orbitals, is really aligned with the P orbitals. You get hybridization, and this is really helping getting a low hole effective mass. This is our champion, potassium tin oxide. This is the most curvy uh, valence band I've ever seen uh, with such a large band gap. Okay, um, I, I just kind of pointed out that, that from 6,000 oxides, you had only 20, and there are reasons for that. The oxygen P is really usually flat and usually doesn't hybridize with, with metals. Um, so oxides are kind of, it's by itself, by nature, very difficult to find uh, for P-type mobilities. So can you go beyond oxide? And this is one of the nice things with high throughput computing. If you have the framework to do oxides, you can do anything else than oxides. And, and we kept on cranking the number and computing, and we extended our database, and we are now around 30,000 materials that are screened, including, of course, non-oxides. The thing you can do also is do some, uh, I would say this is really the most simple data mining you can think of. You can just do some histograms and compare chemistries. But it's already very instru instructive. This is the distribution of effective mass, whole effective mass, in oxide, sulfide, nitride, and phosphide in our database. And you can see that if your criteria is really getting very low whole effective mass, you'd rather work with phosphides than oxides. So this, this is really clear. The problem is that if you take band gap into the mix, as you go with lower effective mass, your band gap is actually getting lower and lower, and the phosphide will tend to have much smaller band gaps, and, and so they will be less transparent. Uh, so you kind, of, uh, you kind of stop, I mean, this is nice. I mean, this is, you can see that in semiconductor simple models, like KP theory and things like that, the, this kind of correlation between effective mass and, and band gap. Uh, so you see it coming from the data, so you're kind of uh, screwed if you're trying to do, go beyond oxides. But there's a way, and you, if you think about it, in certain application, the TCO would actually be very thin. And you, if you're very thin, you can deal with, with weak adsorption. And you can play then with indirect versus direct gap. And then you make your criteria a little more complicated. I just want my direct gap to be transparent, to be larger than 3 V, but I can live with a smaller indirect gap. And if you do that, and you especially look at phosphides, because phosphides showed very, very low whole effective mass, you look at this, you can do this type of plots. This is based on GW calculation again. And this is the best phosphide in terms of effective mass. This is similar to the plot I showed, but now you have two band gaps. You have indirect and direct band gap. And if you put the criteria you want a direct band gap that's higher than 3 V and a low effective mass, you see this material, boron phosphide, really popping out of the data. Uh, boron phosphide is really interesting. It's a very simple zinc blend very low hole effective mass, large direct gap. It's actually p-type dopable. We've done a lot of defect computation in there. And we said, okay, this is impossible. This is a binary 3-5. This must be, this is studied somewhere. So we started looking in the literature. This is a material that has been heavily studied in the 60s, 70s. So you can get some data. Um, and actually all the experimental data agree with, with what we, we, we see computationally. Shows very high 
mobilities for some of the samples, p-type dopability, uh, relatively low absorption due to the indirect gap, and conductivities that are really promising for p-type transparent application. And, and so this is, this is an interesting, it's an odd example where a material kind of has been abandoned, and we hope computation might revive it, because you say, you know, this material might be interesting for that application that, that maybe never, uh, was never thought of. Uh, so this is, this is also one of the things you can get from, from high throughput computing. Okay, sharing is very important. We, we make, I mean, we're building these very large databases. All this data on effective mass and actually more transport uh, related measurements like CBEX or computation like CBEX are useful for many applications, including Carsten talk about photovoltaics. This is really important to have effective masses there also. And we have a scientific data paper, so basically you can download the data and do data mining, do searches. Maybe for your application, some of the materials we disregard are really interesting. So I think this is a, a movement in the, in the community, and this is important. And, and this data is going to be soon available in the materials project, too. So you will be able to get the raw data, but also like a nicer web interface around it. Okay, I don't know how much time I have. Okay. Um, I want to talk quickly about something else that's a little more recent. Uh, it's it's, uh, it's these electrolyte materials. I mean, how many of you guys know about electrolytes? Have you heard about it? It's actually interesting because the chemistry community is crazy about that. So it's, but I think they're really interesting materials. And, and the concept is, is that you have electrons that are basically not localized around the nuclei, but are localized in pockets, in, in 2D layers, and in, in very uh, off nuclei. Uh, positions, and, and the chemists usually say electrolytes are basically materials, ionic materials, where the an ion is an electron. That's, that's a very uh, uh, intuitive way of saying it. Um, these are, this is important in many uh, application fields, and it's also very interesting in terms of the type of physics you could get with this type of, of, of electron localization. Uh, there are actually a only a handful of materials that are electrolytes that are known, and I'm, I'm citing them here. One of the most interesting one, in my opinion, is calcium nitride. You can see these layers here. These are basically layers of electrons between the calcium nitride layers. Um, so these are really cool materials, but they're only very difficult to find. So we said, OK, can we do high throughput computing? And it's a very good example where you can do high throughput computing. You can look, actually, at the square of the wave function around the Fermi level, and, this is, and see if that's localized around the nuclei, or do you have localization of electrons around pockets or more complicated shape. I'm not going to go in details, but you can do that screening on 30,000 compounds. And from that, we discover more than 60 new electrons. By the way, we found back the ones that are known, which is always uh, nice and, and, and reassuring. Uh, and you can do start doing classification between, you can some of them make 0D electrons, I would say, like pockets of electrons. Then you have this very nice 1D channels of electrons. Uh, but the point I want to make is one of the interesting things is this field has this rule that's kind of put a little bit bits everywhere in the in the in papers that says that partially filled D shell transition metals cannot lead to electrodes. Uh, basically, if you have like a fe three plus, it will not make an electrode. It will just capture the electron, and the electron will not be, want to go in this one of these cavities. And we actually found an exception to the rule. And I think that's really the nice thing with high-throughput computing. It can also challenge rules. And this is, as far as we know, the first partially filled D-shell uh, transition metal uh, electrode. Uh, this, is, this is DFT computation, but we've done all kinds of things. We've done hybrids. We've done self-consistent GW calculation. And that really shows the same uh, localization of the electron around the Fermi level in this nice tunnel. And it has chromium. So I think I want to make a point that high throughput computing, it's a little dumb somehow. You do the screening without sometimes putting in rules, but it also helps questioning the rules that might be in the field. OK. Uh, I'll quickly mention that going from one computation, babysitting computation, to many, many of these computations you have to deal with is a big challenge. I mean, if you, have, if you have children, you can imagine that. And so a lot of the work is actually spent in trying to make these workflows and trying to make automata, automatic things. And it's really exciting. Since I started, we started with easy workflows. And we more, more and more work with more complicated things. And things, methods like recently we work on high throughput GW. We are starting working on high throughput defects computation, which also is very challenging if you think about charge defects where you have corrections and so on. 
But really the field is moving in more and more complex workflows, which require more and more complex software to handle that. And quickly, I want to mention we've recently worked on the high throughput phonon workflow, which is close to, to what Nicola talked about. Uh, and this, this led to, uh, this is done with Abinit, and this led so far to 1,500 phonon band structures that have been computed entirely automatically, handling errors and so on. And this is again in a, soon in scientific data, we hope, and, and this is going to be also available on the materials project. Okay, on that, I'll, I'll conclude. Um, I'll thank all the, the people in my group that really uh, worked very hard on this project, the collaborators also, and, and the funding agencies. Thank you very much. <laughs>